Now the final portion discusses the elimination and storage of urine. So we'll start off with the ureters. Ureters are tubular organs, they're about 25 centimeters long, and they extend from the kidneys, they start at the renal pelvis of the kidney, all the way down until the urinary bladder. The, they open up into the posterior surface of the urinary bladder. The ureter, um, the wall is made out of three layers. There's the inner mucus layer, and that's lined with transitional epithelium. So if you guys remember when we talked about the different kind of epithelial cells, we mentioned that transitional epithelium is also nicknamed uroepithelium. And you'll find that the majority of the, um, the rest of the system basically is lined with, most of it, not all of it, is lined with transitional epithelium. And then there is a middle layer made out of smooth muscles, and there's an outer fibrous um, layer. The, due to the smooth muscles, the ureters, the smooth muscles of the ureter are able to perform a peristaltic wavy movement in order to uh, allow for the passage of urine down into the, um, in, to be stored in the bladder. If a ureter is obstructed due to a kidney stone, also known as a renal calculus, that is going to trigger what is known as the urethrorenal reflex. And that is a very strong peristaltic wave to try to push the stone down towards the bladder so that it could be eliminated in, and excreted with urine. It also, part of the reflex is also to send a signal to that, to the same um, side of the, to the kidney on the same side of the obstruction to decrease the amount of urine being made. That brings us to a clinical application, or kidney stones, or the renal calculi, and the, mainly they're made out of uric acid, calcium salts, um, or magnesium salts. They start to form in the collecting ducts or in the renal pelvis of the kidney. Some of the signs and symptoms are um, pain, severe pain, nausea, vomiting, and the appearance of blood in urine or hematuria. So remember we said that the presence of urine, sorry, the presence of blood in urine is an abnormal finding. So one of the things that it could be a red flag for would be the presence of a kidney stone. Kid Most kidney stones tend to pass on their own. Um, sometimes they're just way too big or they're stuck, and we could use these shock waves to, um, to break them down into smaller particles that are easy to excrete, and that is a process known as lithotripsy. Sometimes if they're way too big for that, we would they would have to be surgically removed. The... Um, you know, making kidney stones tends to run in families, especially the calcium salt ones. And the causes of kidney stones, besides being an inherited tendency, um, would be increased calcium supplements. So if you know that calcium stones runs in your family, then taking a calcium supplement or excess intake of vitamin D might not be a very good idea. Um, and other risk factors are urinary tract blockage and UTIs or urinary tract infections. Now down to the urinary bladder. The ur it is a muscular organ. It is a hollow organ that has the ability to distend. So it, ha there, it does have a lot of elastic tissue. It's found in the pelvic cavity right behind the symphysis pubis. It is underneath or inferior to the peritoneal, um, parietal peritoneum, which means that it is not a peritoneal um, organ. It is out of the peritoneal sac. Like I said, it is there for storage of urine. And it has four layers. And I'm going to use the image to actually show you the different layers and the anatomical um, relationships to the surrounding organs, which obviously is going to be different depending on gender. So in females, this right here is the uterus, and that is the urinary bladder with the urethra. So the upper border of the urinary bladder is in relationship to the, is directly related to the anterior surface of the uh, uterus. And that is why during pregnancies, pregnant women tend to have um, what is known as urgency or um, the increased need to empty their bladders because of the pressure um, of the baby in the uterus. In males, 
the urinary bladder is found anterior to the rectum. And another thing I want to sh show you here in this image, but you know, it's also present in females, but you could see it better here in this male picture where the, the ureter opens up into the posterior surface of the urinary bladder. Now for the four layers of the bladder, the, the wall is made out of four different layers. The innermost layer is the mucosal coat. Under, uh, then you've got the submucosal layer. There is a thicker layer of smooth muscle fibers, and together they make a muscle known as the detrusor muscle. And then the outermost layer is a serosa layer made out of um, serous coat. Okay, and that is only present on the upper border, which is basically part of the parietal peritoneum. When you look to the inside of the bladder, you could find three openings. These two are the openings of the ureters, while this opening is the opening that will take you down to the urethra. The triangle made by these three openings is known as the trigone. Now the detrusor muscle, that is the muscle that is going to contract in order to empty the bladder. And looking at this image, you should I, um, hopefully you're able to identify this as a male because of the presence of the prostate gland. And when you look at the posterior surface, posterior um, aspect, you can see the seminal vesicles. Now the urethra is a tubular organ just like the ureter was. Um, the function is different though. The urethra is going to, to take the urine from the urinary bladder to the outside of the body. It's lined with a mucous membrane. It has also the longitudinal smooth muscle fibers. And there are lots of mucous glands. All of these glands are known as urethral glands. The female urethra is shorter. It's about four centimeters long. And that's why females tend to have a higher tendency um, or at risk of developing UTIs compared to males. And the external urethral orifice, which is the external urethral opening, is anterior to the vaginal opening. In males, the urethra is a little bit longer, so about 19.5 centimeters long. It has dual function for urination and reproduction. And there are three parts to the urethra, to the male urethra. There's a prostatic urethra, and that's the part of the urethra that is surrounded by the prostate gland. There is a membranous urethra, and that's the shortest part of the three, and that is surrounded by um, bulbo-urethral glands. And there is the spongy or the penile urethra, which is the longest of the three parts, and that terminates at the external opening um, or the external orifice that's found at the tip of the penis. So here you could see, um, you know, the female urethra compared to the male. And again, because in females it's shorter, um, females are more prone to um, recurrent UTIs or recurrent urinary tract infections. While in male, you could see the prostatic urethra. That's the part, again, that's surrounded by the prostate. You have the membranous urethra that short part surrounded by the bulbo-urethral glands. And um, the bulbo-urethral glands are responsible for producing mucus. And then there's the penile urethra, and that again is the longest part, and it ends at the external urethra, urethral orifice. Now to the major events of micturition, which is urination, and you want to be familiar with both of those terms. It is a reflex. Once the bladder is stretched, okay, the bladder can hold up to about um, 600 milliliters, which is a little bit over half a liter of urine, but we do feel the urge to empty our bladders at about 150 milliliters, and that's due to the stimulation of the stretch receptors that are found in the bladder. That is going to stimulate the micturition or the urination reflex. The center of the reflex is found in the sacral part of the spinal cord. And the efferent neurons or the motor neurons pass through the parasympathetic fibers. Okay, remember parasympathetic is when you are relaxed. Okay, the parasympathetic fibers are going to stimulate the detrusor muscle to contract and to relax the 
internal urethral sphincter. So there are two sphincters in the urethra. One is internal and the other is external. The internal urethral sphincter is made out of smooth muscle fibers. And those are the ones that are under the parasympathetic control. So part of the reflex would be parasympathetic leading to the contraction of the detrusor muscle and relaxation of the internal urethral sphincter. We can control the external urethral sphincter. So the external sphincter is made out of skeletal muscle fibers that we can control. So unless the conditions are suitable um, and we relax the external sphincter, no urination is going to happen. So in order for the um, in order to empty our bladders again, we would have to voluntarily release or relax the external urethral sphincter. Now, urine analysis is an extremely important test because it gives us a lot of clues into health, okay? Not just kidney health, but it can also gives us clues to um, health otherwise. For example, if we find glucose in urine, now we, you know, we want to find out is if the patient is diabetic, um, if they're not controlled, and so on. So it's not just it doesn't just show give us like a window to kidney health, but it can give us a window to uh, overall body health. We could use it to diagnose disorders. We can use it to check for um, drug intake. Like I mentioned, you know, untreated diabetes, they would have glucose in urine. Some things that are um, harmless things, okay, some others are harmful. For example, um, genetic conditions where that can change the color of urine, for example, a condition known as B2-urea, and where the intake of beets leads to the urine to become pink. Um, other things that are normal in some, pa in some people would be after they eat eating asparagus, sometimes they feel or they sm their urine smells a little bit uh, funky, and that, again, is a normal finding in some individuals. What are the lifespan changes that can happen to this urinary system? The Kidney is just like any other organ will age. The good thing is that we have a lot of reserve um, in function, meaning that we could pretty much function pretty much normally with about a quarter of a kidney. So we have a whole kidney and three quarters of the other one as reserve for function, okay, which is a good thing. The by the age of 75, though, the the glomerular filtration rate is going to become less, is going to um, decrease. By the age of 80, the kidneys have lost about a third of their mass, but again, because of all of that reserve, the, all of the reserve, um, you know, that might not really translate into a uh, disease. Some proteins may start to appear in urine, um, which is kind of considered kind of like a normal quote unquote normal finding in um, seniors. We start to lose elasticity of the bladder, ureters, and urethra. So when we lose elasticity of the bladder, that means that the person, the patient is going to experience the increased need to empty the bladder. Especially, that is especially true in postmenopausal women and in um, men due to the enlargement of the prostate, which we'll talk about um, when we discuss the reproductive system. Remember the kidneys were responsible to activate vitamin D. Well, as we age, we kind of lose that ability to activate vitamin D, and there's also loss of bladder control that can lead to incontinence. And this concludes this chapter.